I thought by myself, what can I bring uh, to you in the talk? Because we have so diverse areas where we're working in. And I just want to bring you to something from the data analysis path or da the day-to-day -day work which I'm doing with data, with multiplex data, in hope that we find something which is interesting for anybody of you because that's actually what we share. We all share the multiplexing paradigm in a way and I heard already someone screaming for heat mapping and data visualization so I can recommend something here so in case of questions there are some nice packages from micro array data available which probably are also very suited here and um, I just want to bring this as a reminder for the scope where I'm working in so it's actually Coming from the proteomics, f uh, four years ago I went to Protogen, stepping into the autoantibody business and I had to learn a lot. So it's actually, for me things change a little bit because autoantibodies you treat in a way from the thinking more qualitatively than quantitatively. So it's not true in any case, so you can also of course model quantitative behaviors. But the knowledge what we are going to share mostly as autoantibody people is the presence or the absence or the positivity or negativity of a certain autoantibody targets. That's actually when you listen carefully to the people, okay, my, I'm searching for a certain target or, uh, you know, uh, myositis, this is a myositis antigen, so this is more in the qualitative terms. So anything which I'm talking, going to talk today will be qualitative. And don't ask me what's the advantage of thinking qualitative because uh, you're, of course, reducing uh, your, your thoughts uh, here when you're thinking in qualitative terms. I'm not saying that you should only doing qualitative work, but there are certain advantages in thinking qualities because that's a knowledge which we can share. We can say, okay, this patient has IL-10 antibodies. We heard that already. So this is positive for... Do you, what is the frequency of IL-10 antibodies in a certain cohort? These are the questions we can ask and probably write down and pinpoint and say, is this a ground truth that we say, okay, baseline or inflammation has 10% or 50% or 3% of a certain antibody present? But this is, of course, a difficult question to answer. So, okay, autoantibodies you know better than me. So you see here, this is a paradigm shift. So we are interested in the targets towards uh, antibodies are reacting. And what's, and you, I said this already, this is actually the, 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 the idea, a table from the laboratory Zelik, who was assembling for different diseases, the frequency of certain autoantibody targets. And then you can see, okay, here you have then uh, the SDNA or Rho or La in a certain percentage and that's actually the communication base where we can talk and speak and say, okay, I, in my cohort it's 20%, okay, what do you have? It's interesting to recognize that the autoantibody people of, uh, uh, have a very good, how to say, benefit that certain diseases are really highly related to a certain targets and appearances. This is when you come from proteomics, very bewildering because you are more quantitative and say, here I have to check for specific p-values or so, but it seems to be that certain diseases are really um, pathognomonically related to certain things, but there are of course also other antibodies which are, how to say, shared. For example, TRIM21 as a target, is something like a red light bulb which is uh, present when you say, okay, there is some autoimmune disease or something else. It is not very spe disease specific, but others are disease specific and are also causing specifically trouble. For example, if you have some receptor in the brain where some target is, is affecting that you can explain a phenotype or you see an iron channel is uh, affected or insulin or what, what have you. So this, this is determining diseases. So with this, we are in the lucky position finding some stuff can define diseases very specifically. And I give you one example. This is the systemic sclerosis. The systemic sclerosis is a severe collagenosis. And there are two main autoantibodies which are known, 
which are more or less, how to say, explanatory. When you find topoisomerase, one antibodies or centromere antibodies, then you are very, so you, this is not the diagnostic regime at the point, but you are, this is then already very likely that you are in that story. <coughs> okay, so what's the tool? Beside uh, Luminex instrumentation, you need something to set up an assay. And that's actually, you mentioned already the help, so the initial help. You can uh, produce a lot of proteins and paste them onto beads and create a lot of data. So in total, roughly 8 to 10 million data points per year are produced with this. And this allows us to mine for, say, 5 to 6, six to 8,000 different targets in the course of different diseases, whether to have certain targets or not. So, so data mining, you see here, these guys, is hard work then. So what you do when you, when you have found your targets, when you have narrowed down, uh, you have to investigate them and look what happens in different diseases. For example, this is just a, a, a very small region of a heat map which is created with a program from, from uh, Tiger. I can highly recommend it still. In, you can still download it. It's a free software, uh, a Java software, which is, comes out of the microarray business. It's very powerful, can do statistical tests and stuff. And you see here, in that region here, just uh, these four classes, healthy systemic sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE. And then we have here some <coughs> uh, uh, quantitative uh, depicted uh, autoantibodies, and you see immediately here the uh, RPLPs, ribosomal uh, proteins, do share their reactivity, so they go together in the dendrogram. That's everything is nice. But you also, in a sudden, recognize that what I said initially, that the coverage of these reactivities, for example, here centromeric protein reactivity in SSC, is not 100%. It's only a fraction. And the frequency of appearance of autoantibodies lies somewhere, I, I have to guess, probably 10%, some rare, but uh, uh, in some occasions you are very lucky, you have 60%, 70%. But in putting this together, you have to stack these uh, reactivities to a panel. That's actually the situation when you want to develop a diagnostic test, you have to put them together. And then you're, of course, in trouble how to put this together make this qualitatively, uh, in, uh, develop cut points. You all know this for, from IVD development, that this is a very conservative business, which you then go back and st uh, start in developing threshold values, defining your, your backgrounds, active controls, passive controls. You, so you have to learn a, a lot about your marker uh, when you want to finally be able to put this into a pet, uh, into a panel. So it's probably not that easy like some people think and say, yeah, you just throw it in and then do a PLS regression or random forest and everything is nice because the problem is always calibration of your assays and how to say the stability of the models. And this is usually a very big problem in data sets. And, and now the thing comes into play Probably we should think in these terms, continue thinking qualitatively when we have already our essays with defined thresholds. Can we learn something out of this? Okay, so this is actually the utmost goal at the end of the day. Uh, marketing pictures of personalized medicine, which has been recently renamed to precision medicine. Okay, so every, every five years another name. And so, I said already, what is the, in principle, the, the dimensions what we have? So we can think of biomarkers, uh, whether they are present in a certain person or absent. Of course, you need an assay, you need a threshold. Think about this is already done. You have converted all your me nice measurement data, thrown everything away and transferred this in a, into a barcode, like a dipstick where you say, okay, I just want, I'm just interested in positivity and negativity of my, of my markers here. The same is, of course, true for your protein, because you can ask the question, how many patients are shared between two proteins? You have seen that certain proteins are very related, and this is actually 
kind of contingency analysis. The only thing which you have to do is count, and then you can share your data. That's actually what we are doing. When we count here, for example, and say prevalence of TRIM21 is 68%, then you can look into different assays and share this. On, and you can also, of course, do further uh, statistical stuff from that. Okay, so this is basically what I want to show you in pictures, and uh, uh, this is what I said. The prevalence is uh, a thing which you can really easily digest from uh, a large data matrix. From, from that, you can look into these prevalence data, and that's actually what we share today. Okay, so the people who are frequently doing this type of analysis, and this is the reason why I was adding here a basket, are people from the marketing department. You know this, that people are looking into market basket analysis type of works. So there's quite a kind of analysis, qualitative analysis, where you can look into rules, which you find buying product A, how likely is it finding buying product B? And this is actually what we are interested in. We're so, so we can ask questions. Okay, we have a marker here, so this is a, a certain proportion of our basket. And then, of course, we can ask the question, is there something which two uh, patients share? How does this look like? And setting the threshold, so I think this is an evening long situation where you can think about this situation, how to set the threshold. You know this from the, uh, uh, if you want to binarize data, and this is true data here, so these are data from more than 1,500 patients. And this is actually a set of uh, so-called healthy control samples. And this is the raw MFI values, so each peak is one, one uh, patient, so this are uh, so these spikes here are systemic sclerosis patients. And then there are some reactivities apparently present for, this is actually the reactivity to topoesomerase 1, which I told you is essential for systemic sclerosis. Um, where you see, okay, you can estimate from that how would I set my threshold in a, in a rock type of analysis uh, to be able to to set a proper threshold. This is basically a cutoff value which you do in an IVD analysis all the time. So you can, for example, decide to take them and take, for example, the 95 percentile or 90 percentile of the intensity value uh, to say, OK, that's actually basically what I accept as a threshold. Of course, there are different possibilities. You can do everything, 1.6 standard deviation times whatever. So in principle, it's up to you where you believe positivity or negativity is. Okay, so these cut points, so when you have a multiplex assay, for example, 96 cut points, you have to establish them in a multiplexing way, and you have to look at them carefully. How do they behave? Is it all the time all the same? In my reference plate, is my cut point working nicely? So this is basically what you do, or what you can do in such a situation. You take a reference plate with your reference samples, do a mini assay development, set your threshold, set your cut points, and not only with negative samples, but also with positive samples. So this is actually then, of course, important to see what is the recall of such an, such an approach. So this is basically the workflow here. And so what you, which I would, would like to introduce to you, you can take your multiplex data, then establish the cut points with a set of samples, say 50, for example, take it 90% uh, quantile, apply these cut points, look into uh, how many positive samples you're able to call, and then you can binarize your data. And then, then, of course, apply this cut point to your new data. And then at the end of the day, you are able to cluster uh, your antigens and your patients. OK, so this looks like it is done in reality. So it's actually, you can program this approach very nicely in NIME. This is a tool, hopefully you know this, for people who are doing with multivariate data. And so this actually is the program which does the analysis. So the data comes in, your log transformation normalization. This node is selecting then for the cohort. Here the controls go. Cut points are computed. Cut points are uh, set to this, to this setting. 
And then at the end of the day, you do your clustering. So you do this in R and Python or what have you, because they are executing nodes which you, where you can run R code or Python code and so forth. And at the end of the day, you have a node which does a heat map. And you can save that with this red. You can save this heat map to your disk. So fairly straightforward. So if you decide to do another analysis, you just create another branch and say, yeah, I, here I want my statistical model and so forth. So this is highly recommended. Take home if you're not using it yet. Have a look. It's for people who do uh, data multiplex and multivariate data. It's very highly recommended and open source. OK, so the quality control should be then that you are able to identify your patients. And this is here one example. The antigen, OK, I have set a cut point here. And in my positive cohort, I find, for example, then a frequency of 80%. So I skipped it to next. And then I can, from this contingency, large contingency table, I can throw, throw together everything which I would like to, to see. This is actually, I'm not able only to, to put uh, Luminex data into such type of analysis, but I can also integrate ELISA data. I can integrate qualitative traits when you have them and just bring them together in this one off scenario, just count the overlaps. And that's actually what, what we have here. So any antigen is here compared with the other one, and then we can, and the numbers here given are the contingencies, just a priori, simple a priori algorithm, just counting the numbers. And what do the patterns tell us? So these patterns show now the similarity, basically, or the overlap. In this scenario, it's the overlap in frequency of the markers between, so how much is shared? So you can just, in a, in a glimpse, see, for example, double strand DS DNA in a reactivity has a prevalence of 59%. It shares large properties with the antibody SM. Or the organ tech DS DNA test, which we use as a reference device. So you can put different devices in and see in a, in a very fast way how your, for example, pivotal device uh, or predicative device is overlapping and, and, and behaving similar. And you can also see interferences of markers with each other, or you can see that they form different clusters. For example, I, I mentioned systemic sclerosis. You have two uh, lead antigens, and you will see from these type of analysis that these lead antigens go together and form families where they find their friends and families. <coughs> OK, switching to the patients gives you a similar picture, which allows you to look into the overlap of the number of antigens which patients share. Very similar. We have not uh, antig uh, antigens anymore. And from this, we can learn <coughs> in diseases, and this is actually a systemic lupus here, that the patients do share either a lot of antigens with each other. This is clear when you say, I have this and this and this and this. They are highly reactive. There is a large overlap. But you also, in a sudden, recognize patients who are very rarely having any reactivity, probably being an outlier, which you can then denote or ask yourself, are they correctly diagnosed? Because I've here put in here 60 uh, autoantibodies and more or less only two or three are positive. So probably these patients behave like outliers. And, and I can, uh, when I deal with my customer, interact with my customer and say, OK, look, what is wrong with those? Because uh, uh, in drug treatment, it's very important to correctly diagnose, of course, your treatment group. And this is one reason of failure of drug studies when patients are misdiagnosed. You, you want a homogeneous. You want a homogeneous group. And these clusters tend to form when you have different subtypes of diseases. That's actually what we've observed. For example, in lupus, you have cutaneous lupus. You have uh, different forms. And then you see that they break apart. And then it, uh, with clinical data, which you can put aside, I think I have here, <coughs> here is, it's annotated with disease, high and low disease scores. This is one possibility. Just I go 
over fast. We have heard already about interferon signature. And so these are antigens, uh, 10 antigens, which have been uh, found uh, in the interferon pathway in SLE. And there you see that these were a lot of patients share. These reactivities for the interferon pathways have a very high uh, disease score. So to sum up, I hope that you have seen that it is worth counting sometimes the hatches and to look into contingency tables. This one. Second, uh, to summarize, I think it's worthwhile to consider some tools such as NIMI, where you can integrate your knowledge which you have already aggregated in Python and machine learning Python or R or whatsoever, because this is readily available there. And this also allows you to, uh, to create uh, powerful visualizations. And this is actually coming to the end.